coming up on UGTV. Board of Commission meeting of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. Good evening, everyone. We want to thank you for attending tonight's commission meeting. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. Roll call. Walker? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Here. Mugia? Johnson? Here. Kane? Here. Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbrook? Here. Bynum? Here. Holland? Here. Here. This evening, the invocation is being given by Reverend Cynthia, excuse me, by Reverend George Kemper. Um, please stand for the invocation and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Shall we bow our heads? Lord, we are meeting today to conduct ourselves as the business on behalf of our city, blessing God our hearts and our minds in the spirit of fairness right thought, speech, and action. Impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities so that our affairs may reach a successful conclusion. Bless this meeting with your divine intelligence. We are of a diverse opinion here. Please share a little of your wisdom with us to help us do the right thing for all concerned. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the true republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'd like to ask the clerk if there are any revisions to tonight's agenda. Yes, Mr. Mayor, there is a um, revision to the agenda. Consent agenda item number three. It's a grant for the FYVOCK, the VOCA um, Victims of Crime Act. There is a change to the VOCA grant request from the original information submitted. The request for the FY Victims of Crimes Act grant in the amount, the revised amount now is $244,654 to continue the victims unit. The match amount is now $49,000. $15 from the approved police operating budget and their in-kind amount is proposed, 12149 That total is going to be $305,818. Thank you. So that is the new amount for that item. I would like to ask if um, any member of the commission, staff, or citizen in attendance tonight wish to set aside any item from tonight's consent agenda. You would need to step forward at this time and state your name and the city in which you live for the record and ask that an item be set aside. Anything not set aside will be voted upon by a single vote. So no one is moving forward to set an item aside. It is properly moved and seconded. Roll call. Roll call Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. The vote is 9 to 0. That motion carries. All right. We do want to thank Commissioner uh, Townsend for being on at the meeting by phone tonight. Um, and Commissioner, we would just ask, we we're getting a little feedback on our end from your call. If you could set that on mute, we would appreciate it. Until you want to speak, of course, then you're welcome to speak at any time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 
All right, public hearing agenda. We have um, three public hearings tonight, and we'll open them individually. Uh, the first public hearing is an ordinance for 57th and State Redevelopment TIF District. Um, we will now turn that over to Mr. Brockman for presentation. Oh, and I would like to recognize another elected official who's here, Mr. Chuck Stites, City Council for Edwardsville. Thank you for being here. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Mr. Tonight, staff is conducting a public hearing to hear comments establishing the 57th and State TIF Redevelopment District. Tonight, we have Mr. Dale, his sons, and Max, well, Cord Maxwell representing Polsonelli and the developer in the audience. So, tonight, we have a proposal considering the creation of a TIF district and no immediate plan to advance a TIF plan. So tonight, okay, Let's see if I can get this. Okay, which one? There you go. So tonight, the action item requested before you is to approve the ordinance establishing the 57th and State Redevelopment TIF District. Um, what I'd like to do right now is go over some landmarks that we have in the area. As you can see, the proposed TIF. I don't know why this thing isn't working. I, I brought some back up, so. <laughs> just in case. Okay, this is where the proposed TIF is. Uh, and then here we have 57th Street going down to I-70. And then when you go north on 57th, it becomes Metal Arc Lane. So some of the landmarks here, we have the Escalade Redevelopment Project Area, which now has approximately 22 new homes there, single family homes. And we have the headquarters for the USD 500. And then to the west, we have the Kansas City, Kansas Community College Technical Center. So some of the other landmarks other than that is the new USD 500 stadium complex that's being built. And then of course we have street re, uh, resurfacing going on in, on Metal Arc Lane and State Avenue and the new transit connection. So here is the outline and the hash marks of the redevelopment TIF district. What I'd like to make point is we put the right of way in there as part of the district so we can establish that as part of the TIF eligible cost. And also it's about 45 acres without the right of way and about 48 acres with the right of way. So we really think this area is very unique. Right now the proposed in the district is moving this mountain of dirt that's about 20 foot tall cliffs and bringing it and infilling it to the south and then creating one district, leveling it down, and preparing it for a uh, future plan. So a little bit about the developer themselves. Clifford Dell Sr., Clifford Dell Jr., and Travis Dell are the owners, and which I pointed out in the audience today. Uh, they're the owners of 4101 Powell Avenue, LLC, and they actually own all of the property within the TIF district. So the Dell family has been around since 1984 and has purchased the state tractor and equipment and started a fleet repair company. And then in 2006, they expanded into the state tractor trucking company. And the business is located within the TIF district. <coughs> so some discussion points that I'd like to talk about is, <clears throat> You know, there's no UG commitment on the potential value of future TIF dollars on this. All we're doing is creating a TIF district and then establishing a base. The TIF is a projected pay-as-you-go, which takes the UG away from any type of redevelopment risk. Uh, staff supports the five-year window to advance the TIF plan. Not only does it establish the base, as I discussed, 
that they had three to four years of moving the dirt and the rock from the north to the south and leveling the property, getting ready to start marketing. So uh, as a third party cost, prior to anything, they're gonna be spending about $5 million. And that's moving 250,000 yards of dirt and rock. Uh, they're not asking for any bonding, just creating the base year. Uh, once that is established, after the five-year mark and they present a plan, that would, that would start a 20-year clock on the plan. Um, we think it's a real opportunity in this area. I mean, there's not a whole lot of retail or any kind of commercial going from 70 up to parallel, maybe a little pass in east and west. Um, but, it, but it will give a uh, good opportunity for new businesses to come and create revenue. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Cord Maxwell and the team. You can come up if you want here. And he'll talk about the project and what the company has been doing and what their future plans. And he can answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Charles. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Charles did an excellent job, and I, I know you have uh, many of my other partners to hear from tonight, so I'll try to uh, make it relatively uh, short. Um, uh, Charles did a great job. I am with the Dale Brothers 4101 PAL LLC. We come before you with a stack, staff recommendation of support and also a unanimous recommendation out of the EDNF committee. But what are we really asking for tonight? We're really asking just for this unified government to make a showing to the market and to the redevelopment world that you're interested in 57th and state by creating this TIF district. After that, the Dales will do it all on their dime, their nickel, with essentially no commitments from the unified government whatsoever. We are only asking that you create this TIF district, but we're not asking that these be eligible costs, that we advance a TIF plan. We just want to get out there and get to work and get this site in a uh, place where it could be ready for a developer to come forward in future years. Right now, with on the north side, rock standing 20 feet high, and on the south side, it going 20 feet low, there's no developer that can come and put their dollars into that. But with the Dales and their business and what they do and how they work uh, and how they've built their business over time in this county, we think they can get started, get working on this, start taking these hills down, and get this in a place where hopefully a few years from now I'm back in front of you with a development client that's interested in doing development and bringing forward a TIF plan. And at that time, there would be a development agreement with commitments and others uh, involved in it. But right now, it's just that TIF district. With that, Mr. Mayor, I'd stand for any questions of uh, uh, any of the commission. All right. Uh, before we do that, I do want to open it up for the public hearing, and then we'll take questions in a moment. Um, would anyone here tonight like to come forward and speak in favor of this proposal if you'd like to speak in favor please come forward at this time let the record show no one came forward if anyone would like to speak in opposition please come forward at this time let the record show no one came forward in opposition we will now close the public hearing move for approval second. it is properly <laughs> moved and seconded any discussion commissioner walker uh, the only thing is i for the record i don't think I don't think I am required to do this, but I represented Mr. Dale Sr. after my retirement on a small matter in which his attorney, Mr. McGifford, could not handle. I doubt Mr. M Dale remembers me since we did it by phone and by letter. And uh, he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, who? Really not. <laughs> what? Who? So I didn't want anyone later bringing up that as. Uh, having any involvement after that I don't believe I had any contact with any of the Dales but I wanted that on the record and I also want to say I want to support this project because I think that corner has great potential if there is you know someone really moving this project Corb all right is properly before us roll call roll call Walker aye Townsend aye McKiernan aye Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. The vote is 9 to 0. That motion carries. All right, that brings us to item number two. It's an. Um,
public hearing again on the Turner Woods CID. And we'll turn this over to Mr. Brakovich for presentation. Uh, no. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Commissioners George Brakovich with Economic Development. Let me make a couple of quick introductions as well. Uh, Todd LaSalle is here with uh, Stinson. He actually, uh, thank you, Tim. He uh, assisted the UG on this deal. And then Brent Miles with North Point. Um, who is representing the developer's interest in this. Uh, Craig Gaffney uh, with uh, Country Club Bank, who's the current property owner. And let's see, who else did I miss? Oh, and Chase Simmons, who's representing the developer on this deal. So, uh, Tim, this is actually the wrong presentation. Uh, I can't see, there we are. Okay, almost there. All right, Turner Woods. So what are we here for tonight? Well, we want to conduct a public hearing that we'd advertised for, uh, according to the CID statute. Um, <clears throat> during that time, we're also gonna present some items that are key elements of the redevelopment plan for the particular property. Um, and then ultimately, hopefully, if you see fit after the hearing, um, we'd like an ordinance approved, which creates the CID district, as well as uh, approves the development agreement. Uh, the, the incentive structure on this deal includes both a CID as well as IRBs, so we also have a, a separate resolution of intent on the IRBs to consider. Again, our development partner on this is North Point. Um, should not be unfamiliar to you uh, by now. They've done quite a few in light industrial, business park uh, developments, uh, as well as phase one and two of the uh, Lug Village West luxury apartments, which were the first true class A market rate type apartments we had in our community in recent history, like five decades or more. 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> so before we jump into Turner Woods, which is actually on the very south end of this uh, illustration or this aerial, we want to kind of talk about the potential of the whole Turner Diagonal Corridor um, as we have areas like Fairfax Industrial Area or quickly filling up and, and available ground to build new structures on is, is not going to be available anytime soon. We're looking for new corridors for this type of use. So not, not heavy industrial, but more of a logistics business park type setting. And so we think that there's some real opportunities both along the Turner Diagonal Corridor as well as that I-70 corridor that intersects in that immediate area. But for tonight, we are here to specifically talk about the Turner Woods area. And I know that Brent, they've uh, rebranded this area, and it's now going to be called the Turner Com Commerce Center. Since I butchered it, sorry, Brent. Um, and, and he'll expand on that. But really, for our purposes, it is. It's 130 acres of contiguous ground. It's actually representative of four separate parcels. It's all under the uh, same ownership currently with Country Club Bank. Um, and you see there it's got access, so just south of Riverview Avenue, um, along Turner Diagonal, and then it also has a, uh, a parcel that has access to 65th Street. So before we jump into the incentive structure, I'm going to turn it over to Brent and, and let him talk a little bit about the, the nature of the development and what they're trying to get accomplished here. Brent. Uh, Brent Miles, North Point Development, uh, Mayor and Commission, thanks again for having us tonight. Um, as always, we love doing projects in your community. You've been a great partner with us, and um, I think we've performed and, and delivered on our promises as well. Um, there are several things that sort of merged um, just from the beginning of how we got here. Um, many of you remember um, some time ago there was a chase for a project called Project Socrates million square footer that ultimately landed down um, near Tulsa, we later found out was the Macy's Distribution Center. That got everybody's kind of wheels churning on this site being an industrial site and how it would work and um, accommodating access from Riverview. So that happened. Um, Country Club Bank has had this property for some time. If you've been out there, uh, undulating isn't the right term for this. It is. Uh, it is uh, just like the one before us. You're seeing the very similar type, 20-foot drops, 20-foot peaks. Um, we're, we're moving about a million cubic yards, um, and they're moving about 225,000 cubic yards, to put that in perspective. Um, 
The um, next thing that happened is Riverside Horizons um, was very popular for us. I know that's not popular for me to say here. It's the reality, the business park setting came off the ground and it's been really successful, which lured us into Caw Point. Um, if you haven't heard, um, Caw Point, just like Village West Apartments was for us, Caw Point might ultimately be our best industrial building we've done in our 11 million square foot portfolio. We tour it three times more than we tour Riverside. And some of that is related to access and some of it's related to being in the state of Kansas. Um, there's lots of reasons why it's very popular. Um, when I came to get the approval for Caw Point, I say this multiple times, Commissioner Walker said, that's great. Um, why don't you take Riverside and pick it up and put it here? Okay. So this is where we're at. Um, <laughs> Whatever Commissioner Walker wants. That's right. If Commissioner Walker wants $79 million of investment, I guess Commissioner Walker gets it. All joking Absolutely. aside, um, there's I have not... another one up the road I want you to look at, too. <laughs> Let's get this one approved first. Uh, so um, in all seriousness, finding 130 contiguous acres uh, inside the 435 loop is very difficult. Um, we didn't want to go to an Olathe, a Lenexa. That isn't what we do. Um, we like things that other people don't see. Um, people didn't see Public Levy, and people sure didn't see Turner Woods, because you go out there, there's no access. The ac I'm sorry, the access is very poor. Um, the hills, you got to go through rezoning, there's no utilities, there's just a bunch of work to do, and that's kind of our specialty. So if you've been to Riverside Horizon, some of you have seen it, the exact same buildings that we're building there is what we have proposed here. Um, they're literally in the market known as Class A investment grade industrial buildings. We think this one has um, probably more of a distribution um, uh, use, meaning somebody that really likes that access to I-70 and 635. You might see some light manufacturing or assembly. Um, and these are large buildings, a 391,000 foot building. That's the smallest one here. Put that in perspective. That is the same size almost as Caw Point. Anybody's been seeing the Caw Point building happen, um, these buildings will be larger than that. Um, going through the gauntlet of all of this, we did our engineering. Um, um, George will talk later a little bit about the access and the incentive to help offset that cost with the UG. Um, but um, we spent a lot of time on this site, um, engineered it, hired Continental, um, and they've done a tremendous job. We had our community meeting. Um, the, um, we actually have two people that were at the community meeting that spoke in favor Monday night at the Planning Commission. Um, for this project. Um, so again, I don't think anybody saw it coming. Um, it wasn't marketed as an industrial site, um, but we saw the opportunity and obviously continuing our investment with you all. We, we go where capital is welcome and you guys have always welcomed our capital from the very beginning. Um, so um, that being said, I can uh, maybe, I don't know, George, if you have another site. These are uh, buildings in Riverside exactly what we'll build here. The top building is Granger, so that building is filled floor to ceiling with nuts, bolts, and fasteners. The building on the lower right-hand corner is Gallagher. Um, that is the uh, North American headquarters for um, that company. They're out of New Zealand. Sir William Gallagher invented the electric fence. He's knighted in New Zealand, and this is in Riverside. So this is their North American headquarters. If you buy a fence at Tractor Supply or something like that, it's probably a Gallagher <coughs> fence. The one on the left is Velocity. Um, they, that is their interior finish, which is just unbelievable. So um, basically the offices go in where you see the glass corners. People put their offices there. And uh, inside the guts of the building is either distribution, racking, light manufacturing. It could be dashboards. It could be gear shifts. It could be floor to ceiling, nuts and bolts. We just don't know. We're building these all on a speculative basis, meaning we're going to plop down about 20 million bucks per building and hope somebody comes and fills it, and when they do, we'll plop down another 20 million bucks and build the next one, just like Caw Point. Um, as of today, we're 25% leased on Caw Point with, without the roof on, and we think after tomorrow at 9 a.m. we'll be 50% leased without the roof on. And uh, when we announce that one, um, it supports a very, very major employer in the Fairfax district. So that's gonna be a nice win for everybody. So. With that, I'll turn it back over to George, and um, we talk a little bit more about the incentive structure. Great. 
Thanks, Brent. <clears throat> so as Brent mentioned, it's about a $69 million total capital investment. So between the site acquisition and the, the cost they have with uh, prepping that uh, interesting uh, uh, topography in that area. And then we are, we're estimating about $60 million for the three buildings total. And as you can see on their site plan, they're, they're relatively about the same size buildings. Um, we actually brought this project before EDNF twice in June and, and uh, just this last Monday again. And one of the initial feedback items we had is, well, how many jobs are going to be created here? And so we asked Brent and, and the North Point team to look at the project they did in Riverside and on a per square foot basis calculate what kind of job creation we could expect to see in this very similar product. And so they gave us that number and we actually watered it down a little bit. And even doing that in the formula, we're still coming up at a, over 600 new jobs projected at this site. And I think we have a later slide that actually also includes projected salaries based on what, uh, what they're seeing in those similar uh, products in, in Riverside. So it kind of leads to, well, that's what the developer's obligation is on this deal, and, and what are they asking for from the UG besides the incentive structure? And it's primarily this um, improved access. So as Brent mentioned, it's limited or uh, not adequate for redeveloping 130 acres. And so that um, we've agreed in the structure of the deal that the UG would be responsible for that. And we've got some detailed slides to follow that we show that there, the way the incentives are set up is that there's actually a cost sharing from the developer's perspective to help us offset that infrastructure, public infrastructure. So the bridge, if you're not familiar with it, um, as I-70 is under construction, I, I peel off of eastbound I-70 and go this way every almost every day. Um, <clears throat> The slide on the left is pretty much as you come off that ramp of eastbound I-70 to southbound Turner Diagonal. You can see immediately the Riverview Avenue uh, exit uh, is to your right. Um, it's you know a small stacking capacity type lane that ultimately ends in a stop sign. And then really the, the photo uh, that's more interesting is, is the bridge itself. And you can see that we've placed Jersey barriers uh, on either side of that. Um, so it's not optimal. Uh, it doesn't allow, I don't believe, for enough clearance for two large trucks to pass at the same time. And then the bridge itself, because of the, the time frame it was constructed, as you pass southbound, it actually has one clearance height, which is 13 feet and some inches. And as you're coming northbound, it's actually 14 feet and some inches because of, of the way the ground works. And uh, I'm, I don't think Bill Heatherman's here tonight, but I, and I'm no engineer. Oh, is he? There he is. Bill, I don't know if that's meets DOT requirements or not, so thank you. <laughs> so, um, and Bill actually had a study issued in late 2014, I think is the date on it, um, that, that showed a couple of different options with the Riverview Avenue bridge and whether you go to replace the bridge itself with a new bridge or you go to an at-grade intersection, really the, the premise of it was to kind of move that all south. And so those original photos we showed, um, it gives you some of that additional capacity as you come off of I-70 um, and then it allows uh, uh, from a design perspective to kind of play with those two options. The incentive structure itself then is, is again using two tools, the IRBs and the CID. So tonight the public hearing is to create one large CID district that covers the entire site. The IRBs though would be offered on a per building basis. So the way it would work is you give an IRB, you offer 100% abatement on the IRB, and then you stack back in a CID special assessment that's uh, assessed at $1.04 per square foot on the building size, and then there's a split in that incentive, so $0.52 cents to the UG and $0.52 cents back to the developer to recoup their uh, eligible costs. So that's the structure of it, but I wanted to highlight a couple of the financial pieces of that. So currently that 130 acres pr is producing a grand total of $4,500 in, in annual property tax. So when we calculate the pilot, we don't, we don't push aside that, that current base. It's going to be part of the pilot calculation. What we're projecting for year one on the pilot for the first building is, again, just the UG share is 203000 Again, a, a like amount would go back to the developer. As that building comes off the 10-year ten uh, pilot term, which is really the term that the CID special assessment affects that, 
its full tax value is being currently projected at about $567,000 a year. That, that's total taxes, so we'd have to apply roughly 47.5% to get the UG share. That's the way we've structured it. We've put in one safeguard, though, because, um, well, there's a there's multitude of safeguards. Um, as the project progresses, we don't really have an obligation to build this bridge until they give us notice that they're ready to proceed with the first building. So even though we know that the bridge has got some issues and may show up on our capital improvement in years to come, um, it's not, we don't have to make it a priority until they give us notice. And then we've built in time frames to both design and construct whatever, whether it's a replacement bridge or at grade. Um, now, the way the, the incentives are structured, we have a higher probability of paying for an at grade intersection at almost at full cost than we do a bridge. But either way, we are getting this project to pay for some share and quite possibly a very large share of that public infrastructure. Um, return on investment, that was something that Commissioner Walters asked us at the uh, initial uh, standing committee we went to and so we said well you know it's not like a typical financial statement for us but these are the things we think are very important we get projected 1 million new square feet of industrial space in the in the community we don't have that right now we, we don't have that capacity anywhere we've got these projected 600 jobs and as I was uh, kidding with Bren at standing committee once we backed out the uh, salaries of the executives at North Point we were still at forty two thousand dollars in annual salaries uh, for similar jobs. yeah and Brent says yeah they, the, the number actually went up when they backed them out and then of course we've got this opportunity that the UG's got a partner a proven partner in our community that again is willing to cost share in, uh, in our efforts to replace aging infrastructure so with that, that concludes our presentation. And as Brent mentioned, we can stand and are available for any questions. Thank you. All right, before we take questions, I will open up the public hearing. I'll ask anyone who would like to speak in favor of this to please come forward at this time. Let the record show no one is. Oh, I was like, oh, OK. Just kidding. Go ahead. I told Brent that uh, every word I say is worth a certain amount of money. so. I, I've got a lot of words. All right. Um, I'm Greg Kendall, president of the Wyandotte Economic Development Council and resident of Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, Mayor, commissioners, uh, UG team, County Administrator Bach. Uh, I'm here in support of this uh, proposal, the Turner Woods Community Improvement District, the issuance of the industrial revenue bonds, and the development agreement between the unified government and North Point Development. As George alluded to, if the trend continues as it has over the last several years, we're leasing or building about 2.5 million square feet per year. The 1.2 million square feet planned for this site uh, des is desperately needed to keep up with the demand. So what we have are an awful lot of projects that like to be in Wyandotte County. Uh, Brent noted that in, in their traffic through the building at Cobb Point Park. But today, we don't have a lot of product left to work with. We need to get more product in, in the queue in order to be developed and built so that we can meet the, the overall supply. And as many of you know, we've been working alongside the UG team now for over two years, Brent acknowledged Project Socrates, um, at this location so that we can continue to move product and move projects forward. We think that this development not only spurs additional job creation, as noted, but also is a great use of this site. It's you know, $4,500 uh, versus uh, over $200,000 a year, uh, even during the, the uh, development term. Um, and we've seen consistently the North Point Development's commitment to following through on these development agreements and providing a good product for this community. This is an incredibly challenging site. Um, beyond um, reproach in many respects, as the mayor noted, it's more suited for billy goats. Um, but we think that this proposed agreement overcomes that through the incentives and, and the proposed agreement. We truly commend the developer and the UG team for the creativity and innovation in this proposal to move this site together. And, and we appreciate it and urge you all to support this project. Thank, Thank you. you. Would anyone else like to speak in favor? Let the record show no one else is coming to speak in favor. Would anyone like to speak in opposition? Let the record show no one is coming to speak in opposition. Uh, we will close the public hearing and open up to the commission for discussion. Commissioner Kane. Come, come on, step up. This one or that Yeah, one? you. All right. Uh, you're talking these guys are going to make 20 plus dollars an hour. That's our average in Riverside. Is it really? What's mm -hmm. the average down in Fairfax? Um, 
for the one the two we've signed yes i don't i don't know in riverside we're <clears throat> required to track it because riverside gets half of the state income tax in missouri they have a super tiff I would like you to use some local contractors when you're building this, and you know that. I'm t I'm gonna, yep. You've heard the speech. Yep. So we, um, on this one, we will have, um, we said this, at the, we actually had somebody in the community say this at the public hearing, or I'm sorry, at the um, community outreach meeting. On, on um, Caw Point and on these, um, we'll have Miller Stouch bid this. Miller Stouch is a KCK company. We'll have Arco, Clayco, Miller Stouch. We have three contractors that have the bonding capacity and price competitiveness to, to do this one. We're building that first building, the 391. We're building a 364 with Miller Stouch. That's the biggest industrial building they've built to date. And um, they got bonded to do it, and they've done a great job so far. So they'll be on the list again on the bidding for sure. Okay, now just so you'll know, I'm going to track this. Understand. You know, I, I, and, you, and, and for everyone else that hadn't been on a commission before, we go a long ways back. And this conversation is more for you guys because I will follow up. He hasn't failed me yet. But I want to make sure everyone knows yep. that we're having this conversation. It's on TV and it's recorded. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any more uh, questions from the commission? Commissioner Bynum. Is your microphone on? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a couple of things, and I appreciate Commissioner Kane's comments, and just to follow up on that, but in a bit of a different vein, okay. for the purpose of the public. Sure. Two things. Number one, I called you after you had your neighborhood meeting to ask yes. you how it went. Yes. I appreciated the way you and your company responded to what I thought were very basic quality of life issues for the residents in the area. So I, I commend you for that because it shows me that yet once again, you want to be a good neighbor. Yeah, I'll recap real quick. Please do. Um, the neighborhood, um, we sent notices, I'm gonna round it off, about 65 notices went out and we had about 20 folks show up to the um, KCK um, Technical Center, uh, Dr. Burke Center. Um, <clears throat> the number one issue um, that they brought up from a community standpoint was stormwater, Speaker Road floods now. The f folks that live just south of the site live on the south side of Speaker Road. It floods now. Um, our study says it floods at the one-year event. Um, so it, every time it rains, um, they're getting Speaker Road washed out and getting, getting water across Speaker Road. We're building, I think, seven to nine detention ponds. Um, uh, Continental has designed this and studied it. Um, it's in to review, and I'm not sure if the stormwater part has been reviewed by Bill and Rob's team, so I don't want to speak for them. But in my summary, my words, we're in great shape with that. Um, the number, number two issue was when there was um, a housing um, program, I'm sorry, a housing development plan approved here. There was a TIF and 300 and some houses proposed they had a community meeting and they were routing the sanitary sewer down the creek and then tying into a series of manholes that were along Speaker Road, basically in these folks' front yards. Um, that creek is degrading really fast. We would have had to gone down backyards, the creek, tear out trees, and it's mostly heavily wooded along that creek, of course. Um, Continental found a way to gravity flow the sewer to the north up to Riverview and tie into an existing system so we don't have any easements that we need at all. We don't have to disrupt anybody's yard, the creek, anything. So that was a kudos to Continental for figuring that because we heard that was an issue. Uh, number three, and this isn't disparaging to anybody else, but they've been complaining about J.E. Dunn's operation um, and the noise of it. And so we did a sound study um, on what the sound would be of a truck backing up and then extrapolate that out to the parking, or I'm sorry, to the lot line. And it extrapolates out to about 80 decibels off memory, which is two people talking at three, pe three feet apart. And so, um, it, but we had some people in the community kind of say, well, we live by the train and I hear I-70. So it was a little bit further down the list. Some people it was a big deal for and some it wasn't. And fourth was, there's no sidewalks on Riverview. 
And so you got about 30 kids congregating at 70th Terrace off memory. And of course, they're congregating about the time everybody's going to work at BPU. Um, so um, something needs to be done. Obviously, with the new infrastructure, you can handle sidewalks and you can address that. Um, we said, and we, we still need to talk with the school and get through planning and figure this out, but these are going to be concrete buildings. We can build some forms and, you know, do our washout over here. And if we can build a pad for these kids to stand, in, stand on, you know, while they wait for the bus, we'll figure out some way to do that to accommodate them. So um, those were the four to five um, community issues. I mentioned um, two people that spoke in support. Um, they came to the Planning Commission Monday night, and I know one of those residents has lived there for 40-some years. Um, there was one gentleman who came to the Planning Commission um, who had concerns about the noise, and we gave him, he wasn't at the um, neighborhood meeting, but we gave him the decibel study, and I, I wouldn't know, I don't know if his issue was resolved, he just said he still was worried about noise. So that was a summary of the community issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Walker. I want to make a motion to approve the ordinance. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Seeing no further comments, roll call. Roll call Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Kane. Aye. Markley. Aye. Walters. Aye. Philbrook. Aye. Bynum. Aye. The vote is nine to zero. That motion carries. All right. Thank you very much. That brings us to item number three. Mayor, um, we yeah. also <clears throat> we were also looking for uh, action on the resolution of intent for the IRBs. All right. We, that's item. a second. A second motion is needed. Thank you. Motion so moved. Properly moved and seconded. Roll call. Roll call. Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Kiernan? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. The vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. All right. Thank you very much. That brings us to item number three, which is the Vacation Village Starbond District. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, let me introduce uh, Lou Levin. <laughs> you might not know him. Um, we're going to do. We're going to uh, try to save some time tonight and do a joint presentation between kind of the pr procedural issues we have with some of the changes that are before you, uh, along with we just happen to be in a spot where we're ready uh, to advance the financing component of this. Um, Todd Lasala was uh, also worked with us on this deal, and then we've got Richard Knapper with EPR representing the developer's interest, Chuck Stites with Schlitterbahn and then Kurt Peterson uh, with Polsonelli representing the developer and uh, property owners here. Okay, so what are we here for tonight? Well, we've got a, a long list of things we're here for tonight, but we're only going to ask for one uh, action item. So we need to change some documents because, uh, again, in a nutshell, uh, we'll have some more details on this in the slides to follow, but we, we created this district, expanded and amended district last year. We had an area, Project Area 2, and this is contemplating changing Project Area 2 and splitting it into 2A and 2B. And to do that, we have to have an amendment to the uh, uh, Starbond District Plan, and then we have to amend Project Plan for Area 2 and uh, specifically address Project Plan for Area project area 2A, and then we also have to amend the development agreement. Um, and then Lou is going to talk in much more detail about the financing behind this, and we're ready to issue some uh, star bonds on the project. And then, again, ultimately, if you see fit, we've um, prepared a single ordinance that would adopt and approve all of these items at once. Um, just to kind of go through a recap, in, in 2007, we created this original uh, District for uh, Starbond District for Schlitterbahn. Again, it was all one contiguous area, um, bound by parallel on the north, State Avenue on the south, 435 on the west, and 94th Street um, on the east. So last year we came back and had some changes and wanted to add project areas that would give each project area a calendar, that 20 year window to take advantage of. 
Um, and so again, area one is kind of that tan shaded area and that represents the water park, the existing water park itself. Area two then is kind of that gold yellow color where the auto mall and some additional pad site development on the east side of 98th Street is occurring. And, and really the changes that we're gonna talk about tonight are solely focused on that goldish colored area. Um, uh, area three then we refer to as the front 50. It's that lime green color and really right at the intersection of France family and 98th, the current intersection um, is where uh, the dairy farmers project is going to go in. And you can see actually still on the gold color that borders the lime green where the S curve is being uh, constructed for 98th Street. And then we have area four in purple. So area four um, again, in that middle contiguous area represents the 40 acres that the U.S. Soccer Project is leasing from Schlitterbahn for this. And then the, the purple area on the right or to the east is the Spear family property. Um, and then the area on the left is the overlay back into Village West area. So I am sure Lou may touch on this later, but I just want to point out too. So the overlay on Village West that that is anticipating the new increment that's generated there so we currently have a star bond district in village west that's anticipated to pay off and then we'll close that out then and then we've all kind of talked about what the new value so we know village west produces 650 million dollars in annual sales approximately and our share of that sales tax is approximately 12 million this project doesn't touch any of that it's, and then we, as Lou pointed out to me earlier, there's additional transient guest tax dollars that equate to about another $2 million of our revenue that's generated in that area that isn't touched in this project either. So it's just that incremental value from the retail sales tax that we would be pledged back into U.S. soccer. Um, and, and all of that was already considered as well. Uh, and then Area 5 is the future water park expansion. So I know it's a little bit hard to tell, but if you, does this have a pointer there? So this is the area, project area two. You can kind of see that there's a different shading for area 2A and then 2B. And we've got a little more detail on those. So this is area 2A, again, bound by 435 on the west, parallel on the north. Here's 98th Street, and then these are new uh, interior roads that the developer's putting in place for these car lots or, um, that are ready to go uh, with um, interested parties that have purchased or have the options on those uh, properties. And I think we're going to have things under construction this year. Uh, yep. Richard, Richard said yes. Like, yeah, well, better. Um, and then the pad sites here, you've got the C store on the corner and um, some additional sites here. Then project area 2B uh, would be, um, and this is a little bit harder to tell, this is an auto pad that's not yet been sold or part of this 2A package, as well as these two on the south end, and then you've got the pads that go to the east of 98th. So with that, those are, again, the changes to area 2 that will be reflected in the project plan. Splitting it into 2A and 2B affects the district plan, which we've presented for in an amended fashion tonight. And then the development agreement accounts for that and also accounts for um, originally the development agreement anticipated one bond issuance. By splitting it into 2A and 2B, we'll have uh, at least two issuances off this. And so with that, I'm, I'll turn it over to Lou so he can kind of walk through the mechanics and, and the numbers of that. Hi, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, it, as George said, uh, the action before you approves a number of items, including the amendment to the district plan, approval of the project plan, the two separate areas. But it, but but I'm here to discuss the the financing. Um, as George stated, the original agreement contemplated a single bond issue. What what this amendment will allow us is to have two separate star bond issues and we're ready to move forward with those issues the or, or with the first issuance rather the and uh, what we're looking at is uh, that first issue would have two different series of bonds a series a and a series b bonds the series a bonds uh, the prime the the proceeds are primarily 
uh, pledge to the developer. Uh, as you can see, we're projecting about $63 million. Uh, there will be reimbursement for costs that the unified government's occurring, a little under $1 million. That includes uh, the traffic single to be built at 98th and State and sewer improvements that have, uh, that, that have occurred. The uh, second series of bonds uh, at 10 million, it will pay for uh, the street improvement costs that, uh, that we've already uh, spent to date on 98th Street and the S curve that we're building. And so we've already issued debt for that 10 million, and so what we're doing is repaying ourselves. Uh, I should say this, that the B bonds are subordinate to the A bonds, and so the way the revenue flow will work, the uh, initial pledge will be towards the A bonds. But we have, um, and, and I'm gonna discuss that a little further on the next slide, some of the pro uh, protections we have built into the issue. So the, the A bonds, we're, I'm gonna refer to those as special obligation revenue bonds. The uh, revenue pledge, the unified government's not backing it, it's strictly the incremental revenues generated by the project, and that includes the state sales tax, currently at 6.5%, and, and the city and county, um, I'll say general sales tax, which are about 1% each, and it would be our share of the county sales tax, uh, and any transient guest tax. So if a hotel was built on the site, the transient guest tax revenue would be pledged. However, there's the, the agreement allows for us, us being the unified government as well as the state, to retain the base tax, and that's because two of the, the existing del uh, auto dealerships are being relocated from Wyandotte County, and we would retain the base level of sales uh, associated with that developer. We're projecting the base on that as uh, 15.5 million of of actual retail sales, which equals that 1.3 million that you see there. Um, in addition to the, the uh, base tax, we are not pledging our EMS or dedicated sales tax. And those two taxes, uh, after the, the uh, dealerships are built and we're projecting by 2017, that, that will uh, generate over $800,000 to the unified government. So, so that's really the structure of the A bonds, where the B bonds, I said, is subordinate. So the way the cash flow would work, the, the first incremental revenues will be dedicated towards payment of the A bonds, but we've built in, we'll, we'll have an annual appropriation backing behind the B bonds. However, uh, the agreement we've reached with the state is that of, I, I had alluded to that 15 and a half million of base sales on, on the A bonds that's retained. The state is pledging uh, approximately two thirds of the revenue associated with that base and, and we're pledging our uh, the, uh, comparable percentage and, and that's, and that's uh, 844,000 and you can see that's 844,000 of the 1.3 million and that's going to be held in escrow, and it will only be it will be released on an annual basis if there was sufficient incremental re revenue to cover the debt service. So, I guess uh, if I could simplify that a little bit, we we have an annual appropriation backing behind the B bonds, but the expectation is we we will not. Uh, we have sort of two levels of protection. We believe. The, First of all, there's going to be sufficient incremental revenues to pay the debt, and if there is a shortfall, we have the base sales tax, which the major portion of it is the state sales tax as, uh, I'll say, a backup towards that debt service. Uh, what, what George mentioned is that uh, that this financing, or the amendment rather, will allow for a future bond issuance, and so on the 2B sites, there's the uh, potential and the expectation upon the developer that within, 
within uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a one to two year period they'll have leases in place and they'll be ready to move forward with that phase of the project and then we'll we'll do an additional uh, star bond financing the agreement uh, establishes once we go forward with an additional star bond financing we're going to remove that annual appropriation pledge on our B bonds and and then uh, the money will have not only the incremental revenue associated with the A bonds but will be the uh, primary will we'll be have senior status on the B bonds as a backing on that annual appropriation pledge so, so what we believe is we have a structure in place that allows for that repayment of that debt that we've already issued, that $10 million to recover our costs. Although we have an annual appropriation backing in the initial years, we feel we have uh, uh, strong protection and, and uh, we're able to go forward with the financing. We contemplate that the financing will occur at the end of this month with um, with the actual closing in mid-September. With that, I'll, I'll just return to the the initial slide that George had, and and the one the single ordinance uh, will allow us uh, will cover each of these actions. And I I think that's all we have, George. Were the Nobody any other say. comments I'll for the hearing? hearing? Yeah, from us. All right, I thank don't you. Know if we mentioned there was going to be a short quiz. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. All right, I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there anyone in attendance tonight who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? If you're in favor of this, please come forward at this time. Let the record show no one is moving forward. Would anyone like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Let the record show no one is moving forward to speak in opposition. We will now close the public hearing. Commissioner Kane. Lou, that's way over my pay grade. You, you always do a good job. And if we weren't confused before, we are now. Uh, we appreciate what you guys are doing out there. Uh, the land sat still for a long time. We, we love the work that you're doing. And uh, we I will continue to support you. I make a motion for approval. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Seeing no comments, roll call. Roll call, Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. The vote is 9 to 0. That motion carries. That concludes our meeting for tonight. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>